بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وأرنا الحق حقا ورزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا ورزقنا اجتنابه واجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We continue in the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam having reached Fath uh, Mecca, the conquest of Mecca and we've gone through the major events that took place uh, on that day when the Prophet sallallahu entered Mecca after such a long time there were just a few more incidents and events remaining to be covered concerning the conquest of Mecca and some of the incidents that took place thereafter so we'll be going through uh, some of these tonight insha'Allah ta'ala and so last week we had gone through uh, some events uh, on that day like the Islam of the father of Abu Bakr radiallahu an, Abu Quhafa as well as the Islam of Hind bint Utbah the wife of Abu Sufyan and we also mentioned that the Prophet وسلم, gave several khutbahs, several sermons on that day and the days that followed. And so we went through some of those uh, sermons. And we also mentioned the famous statement of the Prophet وسلم, that there is no more hijrah after this day. And we spoke about what that meant and how you know the hijra that was mandatory uh, it was no longer mandatory the hijra to medina and so today we'll be looking at some of the remaining events uh, that followed now first of all how long did rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam remain in mecca after entering it he remained for a total of 18 or 19 days. And remember that this was during the month of Ramadan. The Prophet ﷺ entered Mecca on the 20th of Ramadan. However, what we learn from the various narrations is that he ﷺ did not fast. And he continued shortening his salah during his stay in Mecca and what we learn from this what we learn from this is that one is still considered a musafir a traveler and he enjoys the rukhas the concessions of a traveler even if he reaches his destination and he's staying there so the concessions that the traveler enjoys not having to fast in Ramadan shortening your prayers etc this is not only during your travel until you reach your destination but even while you're there and we learned this from uh, what the Prophet ﷺ did when he remained in Mecca during this period of time and so the concessions of travel only end they only end when you return home when you return home and you're no longer considered a traveler an incident that occurred during the prophet stay in mecca and this incident uh, has been narrated in sahih al-bukhari and other books and it is that of the woman the woman who was caught stealing the woman who was caught stealing and she belonged to 
the family of Banu Makhzum. Banu Makhzum was a prominent noble family from Quraysh. They weren't just any family in Quraysh. Several noble people or leaders of Quraysh belonged to this family, such as Al Walid ibn al Mughira, the father of Khalid ibn al Walid, as well as Abu Jahl himself and others. So some of the leaders of this family they now were in a dilemma because now you have a woman who's been caught from this family she's been caught stealing and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now has authority over Mecca Mecca is in his control the Islamic laws are going to be implemented so the Prophet Sallallahu was told about her and her crime and so he ordered that her hand be cut off now the family was concerned why? because these people were used to they were used to the fact that the weak and the slaves and those who didn't have any protection from the lower class in society they are the ones who are punished for crimes but if you belong to the nobility and the upper class then there are ways out there are ways out so they wanted to appeal the verdict of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so they wanted someone to go and speak to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who did they choose for this task they chose the son of Zayd ibn Haritha Zayd ibn Haritha was the beloved companion of the Prophet sallallahu he was like a son for him and he had passed away recently as a shaheed in the battle of Mu'tah we mentioned his story and now his son Usama ibn Zayd was also very beloved to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Quraysh knew this very well so they went to Usama radiallahu an and they asked him to speak on behalf of this woman so he agreed thinking that he was doing something good and so he spoke to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about it when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam heard Usama intervening on behalf of this lady his face changed in color and he said are you intervening concerning a head from the hudud of Allah? You dare speak to me to intercede and prevent a punishment, a prescribed punishment from the prescribed punishments of Allah? Usama radiallahu an. He said, Ya Rasulullah, istaghfirli. Ask Allah to forgive me. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went out in the open and he delivered a short khutbah. He said, What destroyed the people before you was that a person of high rank from the upper class in society, if he stole if he committed theft then they would spare him but if the same was done by a person from the lower class a poor person they would apply the punishment on him and then the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said i swear by allah if fatima the daughter of muhammad should steal i would have her hand cut off i would have her hand cut off and so look at how seriously the Prophet ﷺ took it he didn't let this pass lightly 
He took it seriously and he showed the people the seriousness of the matter. And so the hand of this woman was cut off. Her hand was cut off in one narration. It mentions that she sincerely repented to Allah and she changed for the better. And so Aisha radiallahu anha says that she would visit me after that when she would need something from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and I would speak to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam on her behalf. And so this is the story of the woman who was caught stealing. This occurred while the Prophet sallallahu was in Mecca after Fath Mecca, the conquest of Mecca. Now, we mentioned that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam had destroyed the idols in and around the Kaaba. This was the very first task that he, you know, went to fulfill. And so now Mecca was purified of kufr and shirk and manifestations of it. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted to now spread the sovereignty of Islam in the surrounding areas of Mecca. And so he sent different companions on missions to go and destroy the major idols, the big idols that were honored and worshipped around Mecca. And the three main idols that were prevalent around Mecca, they are the three that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, and they are Allat, Wal Uzza, Wa Manat. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Najm, Afara'ayta Allata, Wal Uzza, Wa Manat al Thalitha al Ukhra. Have you considered the idols of Allat and Al Uzza and the third one? Manat Alakum al Dakaru Walahu al Unta Do you prefer to have sons attributed to you, but you attribute to him, to Allah daughters? Why does Allah say this? Because there were super superstitious beliefs concerning these idols among the Mushrikun. They believed that these uh, idols represented daughters of Allah. And elsewhere, Allah tells us in the Quran elsewhere that the mushrikun, they attribute daughters to Allah. And they say that the angels are the daughters of Allah. And so Allah Azza wa Jal goes on to say, Tilka idan qismatun dhiza. In here, illa asma'un sammaytumuha antum wa aba'ukum ma anzalallahu biha min sultan. Allah says, then this is truly a biased distribution. You're attributing to yourselves what you consider to be honorable, and that is males, sons, but you attribute to, to Allah daughters. And so Allah tells us, that these idols are mere names that you and your forefathers have made up. And so we'll see now why, why they consider these to be daughters or why they considered to be, why these idols were considered to be goddesses or females in nature. So we're going to talk about the destruction of al uzza and Manat. As for Allat, then it didn't happen right now. It's going to happen later on because Allat was the main idol in At Ta'if. And the Prophet ﷺ until now had not conquered Ta'if. Once he does, which is going to happen soon in the Seerah, that is when he destroys Allat. As for Al Uzza, the Prophet ﷺ sent. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu an with 30 horsemen to destroy it and this was a big idol 
that was situated at a place called Nakhla, near Qudayd, which was east of Mecca towards Ta'if. So Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu, he went there, and when they heard of him coming, the custodians of this idol, they ran away. And the one responsible for the idol, the main care caretaker of the idol, he took a sword and he put it around the neck of Al-Uzza and he told Al-Uzza, defend yourself against Khalid. And if you don't, then you deserve what's going to happen to you. So Khalid ibn al-Walid, he came and without finding any resistance, he destroyed Al-Uzza along with the shrine that was built over it. When he came back to Mecca, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, what did you do? Khalid ibn al-Walid, he said, I destroyed Al-Uzza. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked him, did you notice anything? He said, no. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, then you did nothing, go back. So Khalid ibn al-Walid, he was upset. He thought he had accomplished his mission. He destroyed the idol, so he went back. And now, this time, he finds a naked woman with messed up hair, and she was throwing dirt on herself. And she was yelling. So Khalid ibn al-Walid, he took his sword, and he killed her. Now when he went back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I found this naked woman and I killed her. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, that was Al-Uzza, you have killed her. And so it seems that Al-Uzza was some kind of jinn or shaitan and it was an idol from the outside but there was a jinn living inside of it and that shaitan now came out in the form of this of this naked woman so when Khalid ibn al-Walid executed her that was now the real end of of al-Uzza so this superstition that was attached to this idol was because of this jinn that was living in it, deceiving the people uh, into thinking that, you know, it was a god that can speak and that has powers. And so Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Al-Uzza will no longer be worshipped after, after this day. After that, we have the destruction of Manat. This idol was along the coast of the Red Sea and it was close to Qudayd in a place known as Al-Mushallal and this was the idol that Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj would glorify and would worship as for Al-Uzza that was the main idol of Quraysh and that's why Abu Sufyan what did he say on the day of Uhud, when the Prophet and his companions retreated, and Abu Sufyan came after them and told them, you know, this is for what you guys did to us in the Battle of Badr. And then there was a back and forth between him and Umar. So Abu Sufyan said, we have Al-Uzza wa la Uzza lakum. So he was referring to this idol, Al-Uzza. So the Prophet ﷺ said, would you not you know, reply to him? Uh, Umar radiallahu anh said, what should we say? The Prophet ﷺ said, say to him, we have Allah as our mawla and you have no mawla wa la mawla lakum. So Al-Uzza was the main idol of Quraysh. And as for Manat, this was the main idol that was worshipped by al-Aws and al-Khazraj 
and they were the inhabitants of Yathrib of Al Medina, who later on became the Ansar of the Prophet. And in their days of Jahiliyyah, Al Aws and Al Khazraj, what they would do, it was their tradition when they would go for Hajj or Umrah, instead of initiating their Hajj or Umrah from the Miqat, they would do it from this idol. And they believe that if you've done that, then you're not supposed to run between Safa and Marwa. This was their belief. And so while everyone else would run between Safa and Marwa, Al Aws and Al Khazraj, if they initiated their Ihram from Manat, the idol, they would not run between Safa and Marwa. And so this continued until they accepted Islam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, to get this superstitious belief out of their hearts, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, إِنَّ الصَّفَى وَالْمَرْوَةَ مِنْ شَعَائِرِ اللَّهِ فَمَنْ حَجَّ الْبَيْتَ أَوْ اعْتَمَرَ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَطَّوَّفَ بِهِمَا Safa and Marwa are among the symbols of Allah. So whoever makes Umrah or Hajj to the house, to the Kaaba, then let them walk between Safa and Marwa. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Sa'ad ibn Zayd al-Ashhali, who was a native of that land where Manat existed. He sent him with 20 horsemen to destroy Manat. When they reached there, they found the custodian guarding Manat. And he asked them, you know, what do you guys want? They said, we want to destroy Manat. So the custodian said, go ahead, thinking that they couldn't do it. So Sa'ad ibn Zayd, he approached the idol. And once again, the same thing that happened uh, with Al-Uzza happened again. Uh, it's mentioned in the narration, it says, a naked black woman came out to him, her hair was all messed up, and she was wailing and beating her chest. When the custodian saw this, he had some hope. And so he said to her, Manat, take care of these men who are disobedient towards you. But his words and her appearance did not have any effect on Sa'ad ibn Zayd and his men. And so Sa'ad radiallahu anhu, he killed her on the spot. And then they destroyed the actual idol and the shrine that was built, that was built over it. So once again, we can see how, you know, there was this superstitious belief that was, that revolved around this idol of it being a female attributing daughters to Allah, how these idols represented daughters of Allah, etc. And so we see the reason for that. So these were the two idols, Al-Uzza and Manat, as we mentioned. Al-Lat, we'll talk about it when we talk about the siege of Al-Ta'if and the Prophet Sallallahu conquering Ta'if and then after that he uh, destroyed uh, Al-Lat. But there's one more idol that we'll mention here and that is Suwa'a. Suwa'a. This idol originally belonged to the people of Nuh alayhi salam. And as we mentioned in the beginning of the seerah, when we spoke about the shirk that was prevalent among the Arabs, the one who introduced idol worship into Arabia was Amr ibn Luhay. And one of the ways he did this is with the help of a jinn, he managed to dig out the idols of the people of Nuh alayhi salam. The idols that Allah mentions in Surah Nuh. وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَاعًا وَلَا يَغُوثَ وَيَعُوقَ وَنَسْرًا The people of Nuh, they said to one another, Do not abandon your idols, especially wad and Suwa' and Yaghuth 
and Ya'uq and Nasr. So these idols, they became history. They were buried in the flood. But Amr ibn Luhay, uh, who came centuries before the Prophet Sallallahu he somehow managed to unearth these idols and you know, uh, they started to be worshipped among the Arabs. So Suwa' became the idol of the tribe of Hudayl. And so with the conquest of Mecca, many tribes accepted Islam along with this tribe, the tribe of Hudayl. So now it was time to destroy their idol. So Rasulullah sent Amr ibn al-As for this mission. Amr ibn al-As, he tells the story himself. He says, when we reached the idol, its custodian was there. And he asked us, what do you want? I said, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ordered me to destroy it. So he said, you won't be able to do that. So I asked, why is that? He said, because you're going to be prevented from doing so. So he had this belief that the idol has powers, it's going to defend itself. So Amr ibn al-As, he said, even until this very moment, you're still persisting upon batil, upon falsehood. He said, woe to you. Does it hear? Can it see? So Amr ibn al-As, he was saying, that's it, Islam has spread. Islam has been victorious. Shirk is now finishing and you're still remaining upon you know, these superstitious beliefs of yours. Then Amr ibn al-As, he approached the idol and he destroyed it. And he gave orders to his men to destroy the shrine that was built over it. Then he, told, then he turned to that custodian and he asked him, now what do you think? Right? The idol is destroyed. So the man, he said, Aslam to Lillah. He said, now I accept Islam sincerely for Allah. So these were the idols that the Prophet ﷺ gave orders to be destroyed uh, around Mecca. Next, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sends Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu anhu to the tribe of Banu Judima. And this tribe was close to Mecca. And this story is found in Sahih al-Bukhari. Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu anhu went with 300 men to invite these people to Islam. So they accepted Islam. However, they didn't know how to express that. So these people were not educated enough to say Aslamna, that we have accepted Islam. Instead, they said Saba'na. What does Saba'na mean? Basically, when someone be would become a Muslim in the early days of Islam, the people of Quraysh, they would say, Sabah, this person has become a Sabi'. The Sabi'a were followers of a religion who believed in one God, and they even believed in some of the prophets. They didn't really worship idols, but they did believe in uh, different gods. And Allah mentions them in the Qur'an. Asabi'un. Allah mentions them in the Qur'an. So Quraysh would use this label as a derogatory term for anyone who would become Muslim. So they wouldn't say so-and-so aslama, so-and-so has become a Muslim. They would say so-and-so sabah, he has become a sabah. So now Khalid ibn al-Walid radiyallahu an told them to become Muslim. And they said, Sabahna. They said, we have, we have accepted Islam. But they didn't know how to say it properly. They didn't know that the, the term we should use is Aslamna. We have accepted Islam. Why? Because 
you know, they, they were educated. They used the term that they had picked up from others. And they heard this term being used all the time for anyone who becomes a Muslim. So they just repeated that. And they kept on saying, Sabatna, Sabatna, while Khalid ibn al-Walid, he's looking at them. And, you know, he, he's, not, he's not accepting it from them. So then, when he saw this, and he saw that they were just repeating the same thing, he thought that what they were doing is they were mocking him. And they were making fun of Islam. And they were insulting Islam. So he started killing them one by one. He killed them and he took the rest as prisoners. And then he handed over one captive to each of his companions, to his army. And he gave instructions to each of his soldiers to kill his captive. So in his army was Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma. Abdullah ibn Umar, and he narrates this himself, and it's in Sahih al-Bukhari. He says, in the name of Allah, I am not going to kill my prisoner, nor will my companions kill theirs. Abdullah ibn Umar, he saw this as a clear mistake on the part of Khalid ibn al-Walid. These people have become Muslim, and now we're being told to kill them. So he refused to comply to the orders. Not only did he himself not do it, but he also said his companions, those who had come with him, his buddies who had come with him in this, uh, in this small army, he said they are also not going to comply with your orders, O Khalid. So now when they went back to the Prophet wasallam, they brought it up with him and they told him what happened. And so... The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He told Abdullah Ibn Umar That what you did was right And then The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam raised his hands And said O oh Allah Inni abra'u ilayka Mimma sun'a'um Khalid O oh Allah I am free From what Khalid has done I disassociate myself from what Khalid ibn al-Walid has done. And he said it twice. And so these people, the Prophet ﷺ was saying, they should not have been killed. They made a mistake. And what Khalid ibn al-Walid had done was a grave mistake. While the Prophet ﷺ approved of the actions of Abdullah ibn Umar for disobeying the orders of Khalid ibn al-Walid. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa felt sorry for these people and what had happened to them. So he sent Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an to pay the diyah, the blood money, as compensation for those who were killed. Uh, why? Because they died as Muslims. Right? It's not as if they had died as kuffar and here the Prophet is paying blood money on their behalf. No, the Prophet ﷺ never did that. He would only pay the blood money, the diya, for a Muslim who is killed, even if he is killed by mistake. And these are part of the ahkam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah mentions these rulings uh, in Surah An-Nisa. So anyways, the Prophet ﷺ, uh, sent Ali radiallahu an with this task. And not only did he... Uh, pay the blood money but also he returned to them any belongings that were taken from them by the Muslim army and then Ali radiallahu an he had some leftover money and he gave it to them just in case as a bonus he left it with them and so this is how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam he dealt with this mistake of Khalid ibn al-Walid and so these were some of the outstanding events that remained to be discussed following Feth Mecca, the conquest of Mecca. Next week, we'll move on to mention how Islam was now spreading 
and the tribes were entering into Islam uh, in huge numbers and we'll also mention some of the prominent figures from among Quraysh who accepted Islam after uh, the conquest of Mecca. And so we conclude with some of the lessons that we learned from tonight. The first lesson that we learn is that we see from what we have discussed tonight is the justice of Islam. We learn from the story of the woman from Banu Makhzum who was caught stealing that whenever there is a double standard in society in applying justice where the lower class is punished while the upper class are spared how the Prophet ﷺ mentioned such a society will be destroyed by Allah Allah will destroy them He will take away any barakah from that society and so unfortunately nowadays not only do we have a double standard in applying the law of Allah but in fact we don't even have the law of Allah applied in many Muslim countries so if Allah would destroy a society and take away barakah from that society just because they have a double standard in applying the law of Allah then what would be the case where as we have it today where the laws of Allah are not even applied to begin with in one hadith the Prophet sallallahu says applying one had on earth the hudud are the prescribed punishments of Allah for different crimes those punishments that are you know enshrined in our sharia that we find in the Quran or in the Sunnah for certain crimes and theft is one of them as we mentioned as Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in Surah Al-Ma'idah and so these hudud uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says applying one had on earth is better for its people than 40 days of rain than 40 days of rain and so there's more barakah in applying the hudud of Allah than rain that brings vegetation and khayr and you know water uh, for us and animals to drink from etc and so this shows us how much barakah we're missing out on you know when we look at the Muslim world today look at our state this is one of the main reasons for why our Muslim countries are in the condition that they are in economically financially you know why is it that you know our Muslim society suffer this way it's not because we don't have resources you know go from east to west and you see Muslims are sitting on huge swaths of land huge amounts of resources natural resources that could bring riches to to uh, to those societies so it's not that we are lacking in resources and we cannot become independent and well off no it's because Allah Azza wa Jal has taken away the barakah why because we have replaced the laws of Allah with man-made laws and we are running our countries based on man-made constitutions instead of the law of Allah and the constitution that is based on the Quran and the Sunnah the second lesson that we learn is destroying idols and other manifestations of kufr and shirk we saw how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam made it a point to destroy all of these idols that the people of Jahiliya were so obsessed with and so he made this a priority of his 
and he did not delay it. And he didn't hesitate in giving orders to destroy them. Right? The Prophet ﷺ didn't say, well, you know what? These people, they just became Muslim today. Let's go back to Medina. Let a few years go by. Let these people, you know, become accustomed to Islam and its customs. Then we'll go and destroy those idols. No. Why? Because this is related to the very core and the foundation of Islam. The concept of Tawheed and Shirk is the opposite of a Tawheed. And so the Prophet wasallam, as we mentioned, as soon as he entered Mecca, the very first thing that he did, the same morning, he destroyed all of these idols. He didn't hesitate. He didn't say, well, the people of Quraysh, they're attached to these idols, it'll take some time. No, right away. And then we see how he did the same with the idols, the major idols around Mecca. And so, in doing so, he was following in the footsteps of his father Ibrahim السلام, who did the exact same thing, smashing the idols of his people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not rebuke Ibrahim السلام, when he narrated his story to us, right? Allah Azza wa did not criticize Ibrahim anywhere when he mentions that story, right? Showing us that what he did was completely right. Right? And so, likewise, whenever Muslims conquer any land, and they have sovereignty, they control, they have the ability to remove these idols and other manifestations of kufr and shirk, they have to do the same thing. They have to swiftly destroy and level any idols that are worshipped or even not worshipped but if they are idols and statues they need to destroy them the same goes with any tombs and graves that people are going to them and worshipping them they need to be leveled right and this rule applies to all times and to all places and that's why one of the first things that, you know, uh, that resulted in the da'wah of Shaykh Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab when he conquered various parts of the Arabian Peninsula, one of the first things that he did was he would level these tombs that were built over graves. And he did not spare a single grave, not even the graves of the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and so Baqi' in Medina today, you see it as flat, without any structures built on it. But several centuries ago, before he had come in, before you know the 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 his students came in and you know took over Medina. Prior to that, there were statues or there were shrines built over the various graves of the Sahaba radiAllahu anhu. And so even today. The same applies. And so we Muslims should not be afraid. We shouldn't think that just because the kuffar, as they have done today, through their international organizations, through the United Nations, they've established international laws. And one of these laws is that you're not allowed to destroy, you know, ancient archaeological sites, etc., it doesn't mean that we Muslims have to abide by these laws when they go against the teachings of Islam. And so that's why, you know, not too long ago, about 20 plus years ago, we had the famous incident of, in the year 2001, the Taliban who had controlled more than 90% of Afghanistan. This was before 9-11. We're not talking about today. We're talking about, you know, 23 years ago, in March of 2001, once they had controlled most of Afghanistan, they went to two huge, massive statues, and they were statues of Buddha, and they destroyed them, right? They destroyed them, and this caused a huge international outcry. 
and it was led by the Western world. And so we Muslims should not care about that. And so the lesson here is that when we are, dis when we are determined to do something for the pleasure of Allah, and it is in line with our Sharia, ah, then we should not be deterred from doing it, seeking the pleasure of the people. This is the lesson that we learn from this, right? We shouldn't become deterred from doing something when we are seeking the pleasure of Allah. We shouldn't become deterred from doing it to please the people. So here you have the pleasure of Allah versus the pleasure of the people when it when it conflicts, you have to put forward the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third lesson that we learn is concerning obeying the leaders in Islam. And so in our deen, there is a lot of emphasis on obeying those in authority over us. And so we have many uh, ayat in the Quran where Allah azza wa jal commands us to obey our leaders and those in authority over us. However, however, this obedience, it's not supposed to be unrestricted or unconditional. Rather, it is conditional to the obedience of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so we learn this from the actions of who? The actions of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhu. When he disobeyed the orders of his leader, his Amir, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anh, who ordered him to do something that he saw as being clearly haram. And so, without a doubt, this was disobedience to the Amir. And Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anh, he knows very well the teachings of Islam that tell us that you're not supposed to disobey your Amir, right? However, he also knew very well that one is not supposed to follow the orders of the Amir when the orders are not in line with the teachings of Islam. As the Prophet ﷺ says, لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق There is no obedience to a created being when it means disobedience to the Creator Allah. And so, even though we know that, you know, mutiny, uh, where soldiers or commanders of an army disobey the higher in command, this is something very dangerous, and it's not tolerated. It doesn't go unpunished. You know, it's something severe. And even in our deen, you know, our, our deen is no different. You're supposed to obey the leader, even the military commander, and you're not allowed to disobey him. But here, Abdullah ibn Umar, not only did he disobey himself, but he told his, his, his boys, his companions, that you guys are not going to follow his orders as well. And so the lesson we learn from this is that if a Muslim leader tells us to do something haram, we must disobey him in that. We must disobey him. In that. This is where many Muslims get it wrong. They have a wrong understanding of what it means to obey our rulers. And so when they see Muslims uh, not complying with the laws uh, that the rulers of Muslim countries legislate, and they rebel against that, they say, oh, you know, this is haram. You have to obey the rulers. And so we have to look at everything in context. It's not black and white, right? There are times when the rulers are not supposed to be obeyed, and this is one of those examples. Finally, the last lesson that we'll mention is how to deal with the mistakes of the leaders. We saw how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dealt with the mistake of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. Here you had innocent Muslims who were killed, right? These people, you know, inside their hearts, they had accepted Islam. They had sincerely accepted Islam. However, they didn't know how to express that. 
Khalid ibn al-Walid, he killed them. Uh, the question is, why did he kill them? He killed them because of what is known as ta'wil. He made a wrong judgment. Right? Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ fire him? Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ imprison him? Why didn't the Prophet ﷺ punish him? Because it was an honest mistake. Right? And so Khalid ibn al-Walid did not assume that these people had accepted Islam. Instead, he had thought that they were insulting Islam. Right? And that was absolutely clear to him. So he killed them. If he had actually thought that they had accepted Islam, he would never have done this. He would never have killed them. Right? And so, if he had done them, thinking that they had accepted Islam, then it would have been a different story. The Prophet ﷺ would have punished him, without a doubt, right? But here, Khalid ibn al-Walid, he did not kill these, these people, assuming them to be Muslims. He killed them, assuming them to be kuffar. And so, that is how the Prophet ﷺ dealt with him. He didn't punish him, he didn't relieve him of his post, Right? Why? Because he made an honest mistake. And so you don't deal with every situation and every mistake and error in the same way. And this is what we learn from the actions of the Prophet wasallam from this story. Ibn Kathir, and we'll close with this, Ibn Kathir, he says, commenting on this story, he says, Khalid ibn al-Walid intended to give Nusrah to give victory to Islam and its people, although he made a mistake in the situation, thinking that these people were, were insulting Islam by saying, Sabatna, Sabatna. He did not understand from them that they had embraced Islam. Consequently, he killed a large group of them and he captured the rest, killing most of the captives as well. Despite this, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not remove him from his position but continued to keep him as a commander although he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam disavowed the actions of Khalid in this instance and paid compensation for the blood and the property wrongfully taken this indicates one of the scholarly opinions that the mistake of the Muslim leader is to be compensated from the public treasury from Bayt al-Mal and not from his own wealth. Meaning, the Prophet ﷺ did not order Khalid ibn al-Walid to pay the diya from his own money. Why? Because it was a mistake that is, you know, uh, associated with, with the government and with the Amir. Ibn Kathir, he goes on to say, for this very reason, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu an did not dismiss him, did not dismiss Khalid when he killed Malik ibn Wayrah during the Ridda Wars, the apostasy wars, interpreting his actions when he chopped off his head and took his wife, Umm Tamim, for himself. In the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu an when he was a Khalifa, Malik ibn Wayrah he had apostated and he did not send zakat to he didn't recognize Abu Bakr as being the Khalifa of the Prophet so he was no longer sending zakat so the Prophet, uh, Abu Bakr an, he sent Khalid ibn Walid to fight Malik ibn Wayra Malik ibn Wayra was brought to Khalid ibn Walid and he said the shahada he said the shahada. Nonetheless, Khalid ibn al-Walid chopped off his head. Why? Because he was still not, he was still preventing zakah. And zakah is a pillar of Islam. And that same day, he took the wife for himself. The wife of Malik ibn Wayra, he took her uh, for himself. So Abu Bakr radiallahu an did not relieve him of his position. 
So Umar ibn al-Khattab, he got very angry. And he said to, to Abu Bakr, he said, dismiss him, fire him, because there is recklessness in his sword. He's, he's reckless, he's careless with his sword, meaning Khalid ibn al-Walid. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, I will not sheathe a sword that Allah has unsheathed against the mushrikun. I am not going to rest this sword. This is the sword of Allah. As the Prophet ﷺ testified when he said, Saif min suyufillah. This is the sword of Allah. Nonetheless, Abu Bakr did not dismiss him. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ himself did not dismiss Khalid ibn al Walid when he made the mistake that he made. It was later on in the time of Umar, he had this personal you know, problem with. Khalid ibn al-Walid and so he did relieve Khalid ibn al-Walid from his position but he mentioned the reason for that right Khalid ibn al-Walid was winning battle after battle you know he was undefeated so when he relieved him he said the reason I'm doing this I don't want people to think that the victory is coming as a result of Khalid. I want the people to know that victory is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Khalid ibn al-Walid, even though he was the mujahid that he was, he did not he did not die as a shaheed. He did not die as a shaheed. He died on his deathbed for this, for this reason. Nonetheless, these are the lessons that we learn from what we have learned from the events of tonight. And so we'll continue next week, insha'Allah ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wa salli allahumma wa sallim ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.